Welcome to the Clayton Tyner Podcast, where I help you view current issues through the ancient wisdom of Scripture. This week, famous atheist Richard Dawkins came out as a cultural Christian. He does not believe in God or Jesus or any of the claims of Christianity, but he likes cathedrals and hymns and a society built on the Christian worldview. Does it make sense for one of the biggest critics of Christianity to complain about its demise? Charlemagne the God filled in on The Daily Show and let us know his thoughts on DEI policies. Conservatives were quick to celebrate his monologue as a strike against the very core of equity-based systems. However, is that really what Charlemagne said? We will listen closely and find out. Former President Trump released his official position on what he is calling abortion rights. Many of his supporters were disappointed to see a more neutral approach to the issue of life. Is this Trump waffling on our time's most important issue, or is is it simply a political strategy to try and take back the White House? All that and one look at the controversy over a former OnlyFans girl who has left that life to pursue her faith. The newly converted young woman sat down with podcaster Michael Knowles and shared her story and her new goal of finding redemption through following Jesus. Many are questioning the legitimacy of her conversion and boldly proclaiming she should not be platformed. How should we think about these radical come to Jesus stories? Let's find out together on episode 57 of the Clayton Tyner podcast. Welcome to episode 57. So excited to get things rolling. Uh, I've got some important topics to get to today. If you're new to the podcast, my name is Clayton. I'm the lead pastor at Meta Church in San Antonio, Texas. I would love for you to check us out at youtube.com slash Meta Church. God is really doing a tremendous work. We just wrapped up a five-week series called Investigating Easter and ended that series with baptisms this last Sunday. We baptized 60 eight people. God is really moving and doing incredible things at Meta Church. And with my job as lead pastor, primarily what I'm doing is organizing our staff. And I spend a lot of my time preparing a sermon each Sunday. And that's where I'm taking a passage of, of scripture and I'm starting with scripture and I'm getting into the text and I'm helping apply it into our lives. What I do on the podcast is I start with stories that are going on out in the world. I look at the news and things that are trending. And my goal is to help Christians take a biblical like Christianity inspired view of what's going on in the world. Typically what that helps us do is get out of our polarized bifurcated political positions and find a little bit more nuance somewhere in the middle. I definitely don't do that perfectly, but I am striving to just help you be spiritually informed and biblically informed. Typically we look at three stories in the news and then one other thing that it just kind of struck me as a good idea to talk about. If you want to support the work that's going on on the podcast, I'd encourage you to go to patreon.com slash Clayton Tyner. That's Clayton T-Y-N-E-R. There's a, a couple different tiers that you can come in to help support the work that's going on here. We celebrate milestones together, like hitting a thousand subscribers last week. I put out a live Q&A every single month, which means you get to come into a Google Meet with me and we get to chop it up instead of you just listening to me on a recording. We also have a lot of exclusive content that is only for Patreon members, as well as early access to some events. So make sure you check that out, patreon.com slash Clayton Tyner. At this point, I'm really just trying to cover the costs of what it takes to run the podcast on the back end. Well, without further ado, let's get to today's three points. In 2006, Richard Dawkins, who is one of the new atheists who aren't so new anymore, he put out his book, The God Delusion. I have a little bit of a summary of The God Delusion here. In The God Delusion, University of Oxford biologist and anti-religion activist Richard Dawkins seeks to demystify religion and discredit faith. He explores the unlikelihood of God's existence, how evolution by natural selection explains the centrality of religion to the human experience, and how religion promotes immoral values, impoverishes the 
human mind and provides justification for intolerance and persecution. Here's the key. He argues that ultimately, like here's the point of his book. Ultimately, we as humans must free ourselves from our self-imposed shackles by destroying faith and religion and positively embracing the full potential of our species. All right. So pay attention to that. He argues that we have to free ourselves from self-imposed shackles by destroying faith and religion and positively embracing the full potential of our species. So that is what Richard Dawkins wants to do. And between him and Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and many other uh, of these new atheists who took control of just understanding the internet and the platforms that were available, got huge publishing contracts and led millions and millions of people out of faith and into atheism or agnosticism. And man, these guys were sharp and they were cunning and they have like great video clips where they just are destroying people and they make belief in Jesus sound like the stupidest thing imaginable. And in large part, the new atheists have got a lot of what they set out to do. They've been very successful and we have moved further and further away in the West from our Christian heritage. We once were thought of as kind of a Christian nation. I make the case all the time on the podcast. We are no longer Christian. We're no longer post-Christian. We are now at least pre-pagan, we're beginning to worship things like sex, sexuality, and power, as well as nature. Probably the dominant religious force is is worshiping nature and giving sacrifices and homage to to nature and to climate. So they got what they want, and now they don't really love the results. And so Dawkins went viral this last week for calling himself a cultural Christian. Let's take a look at that. That We we are culturally a Christian country. I call myself a cultural Christian. I'm I'm not a believer. But there's a distinction between being a believing Christian and being a cultural Christian. And so, you know, I, I love hymns and Christmas carols. And um, I, I sort of feel at home in the Christian ethos. I feel that we are a Christian country in that sense. Uh, it's true that statistically the number of people who actually believe in Christianity is going down. Uh, and I, I'm happy with that. Bruh. But I would not be happy if, um, for example, we lost all our cathedrals and our beautiful parish churches. Um, so I, I count myself a cultural Christian. I think it would matter. If we certainly if we substituted any alternative religion, that would be true, truly dreadful. It would be truly dreadful. Now, what did he want in 2006? We as humans must free ourselves from our self-imposed shackles by destroying faith and destroying religion and positively embracing the full potential of our species, which you can infer the full potential of our species can only actually come if we are able to fully destroy faith, all this blind faith and all this nonsense and all this religion. So the new atheists pushed for a godless society and now are appalled by many of the results from their success. And a lot of these guys, you know, the the four horsemen of atheism who came out in the early 2000s, a lot of these guys now are extremely dissatisfied with the way culture is shaping up. Number one, they almost astronomically overestimated how people would be able to fill the gap that faith plays in their life and the need for people to have some kind of a redemptive impetus in their life, like a transcendent God who does set moral objectives for us. And what's frustrating is there were Christian apologists and Christian scholars who were debating these guys and saying these exact same things. If we go for atheism, then we have no objective grounding for morality. There's no Christian scholars who are saying that an atheist can't be moral or that there aren't ma- uh, there aren't atheists who live even better moral and ethical lives than some Christians do. Nobody's saying that. What we're saying is on atheism, you cannot objectively ground morals and ethics where it's like right all the time, regardless of situation. You need something transcendent for that. And so if morality and ethics just comes down to your opinion versus my opinion, then really you don't have morals or ethics. You just have opinions and whoever holds the most power will win. And Dawkins is now dreading the idea that instead of a Christian culture built on the foundational teachings of Jesus that has shaped, especially the Western world into what it is today, that it will be replaced. And he says that could be 
dreadful. And so it's not working out. The other thing they greatly underestimated was the religious impulse inside the heart of man. People will worship something. They have to. This is Carl Jung's point that everyone has a hierarchy of value. And at the top of that value, you might as well call that your God because it's going to be the thing that orients your life. And when you actually remove God, the God of scripture from that equation, whatever you replace it with will be less than, and ultimately it will not be satisfying. And ultimately it will not fulfill. And it can't actually lead you to a purpose that will be meaningful and impactful in your life, even if you achieve your goals of your highest value. Maybe that's wealth or status or power or sexual attention, whatever that is. Even if you achieve it, you will still end up empty inside because it cannot speak to the purpose that you were created with. So. There's all kinds of wisdom about this in scripture. Proverbs 14 says there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And this is kind of where these guys were at. Some of them were biologists like like Richard Dawkins, and he's looking at evolutionary biology and how he feels like it can just explain everything and we don't need a God and faith is a cop out and it's the God of the gaps and how really religion has just caused so much untold suffering. And there's so many rules that are bearing down on people. There's a way that seems right to him. And he pursued that he became massively famous and wealthy off of that pursuit of pushing atheism out into the public sphere, decrying religion and faith at every turn. He was successful. And now it's like, Oh, I mean, the, the metaphor, metaphor of having sawed off the branch that you're sitting on is completely applicable to this situation. He, and what's so interesting is he just likes the trappings of it. He likes the cultural bedrock that Christianity gives him, and he likes the trappings. He likes the cathedrals. He likes the hymns. You know, a lot of atheists were probably very shocked to hear Richard Dawkins say this. I like the cathedrals. I would hate if all the cathedrals were gone. At the same time, in the same video, he says, less and less people believe in God, and I'm glad. Bruh. That's a good thing. It, it's so good. My work is successful. Less and less people believe in God. Less and less people have faith. Oh, but don't get rid, don't get rid of the cathedrals, though. Wow. I mean, let's not stop singing hymns that would have never gotten written if people didn't believe that they were writing them to a transcendent God. I like the cathedrals. This would be like someone who spent their entire public career fighting against the NFL. They hate football. They think it's not worth it. It's a dangerous sport. It riles up the inner animosity of men and they were successful. I mean, more and more people were just like, the NFL is terrible. The NFL is unethical. It's immoral. We shouldn't be doing it. And the numbers just start draining and draining and draining. And then all of a sudden they come out and they're like, well, I mean, I don't want Sundays to not have football games. I mean, I like that rhythm in my life. I think it's culturally good. Oh, don't tear down the stadiums. I love the stadiums. They bring in a, a lot to the economies of the cities. That they're in. It's like, dude, you have been trying to poison this movement for decades now, and you're unhappy about the obvious results of your success. If nobody believes in God, there's not going to be any cathedrals like the disconnect here, the cognitive dissonance that is creeping in to the success that the new atheists have found is shocking. And it maybe should point us to some legitimacy. I think there are all kinds of cases to be made for Christianity. I do think there is a cultural case for Christianity. And this is partly what Jesus was talking about, whether or not his teachings are true. He says in Matthew seven, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Bad philosophy has bad outcomes. Bad theology has bad social and cultural outcomes. Good theology the right things, truth, actual truth will produce good. And it has, I mean, you can just look at all of the things that Christianity has brought into the world and how it's completely remade and reshaped. Talk about it all the time here on the podcast. You look at that and it's like, we don't like the idea of faith and we feel like it's anti-science and we're going to put all of our energy into destroying it. And once we get close to destroying it, we're going to lament that having destroyed it, we also destroy all of the good that it brings into society and all of the ethical and moral clarity that it brings with us and, and all of the ways that it erase the lines and distinction that have separated people for almost all time. The new atheists pushed for a godless society and now they are appalled by many of the effects in society of their success. And we should really, really pay attention to that and wonder if Dawkins is a cultural Christian, is that enough? 
If people like the cathedrals, but don't like the God that it represents, the cathedrals will not stand. Ultimately, we will go the way of our beliefs. Charlemagne the God was a guest host of The Daily Show, and in his monologue, he went off on DEI, that's diversity, equity, and inclusion policies and practices, the seminars that go in, the offices of DEI in big Fortune 500 companies, and very, very quickly, conservative pundits and just conservatives all over social media jumped on this and were like, the tide is turning, Charlemagne's on our side, he said DEI is garbage, but is that what he actually said? Let's listen to Charlemagne himself. Thing I say, the truth about DEI is that although it's well-intentioned, it's mostly garbage, okay? It's kind of like the Black Little Mermaid. Just because racists hate it doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> and you know I'm right because every one of you has sat through one of those diversity training sessions and thought, this is bullshit. <laughs> And it's not just you. Over 900 studies have shown that DEI programs don't make the workplace better for minorities. In fact, it can actually make things worse because of the backlash effect. Remember D.A.R.E. from school? Y'all remember D.A.R.E.? Yeah. <laughs> she said, woo. De <laughs> DEI training is like D.A.R.E. for racism. And, and you all know how effective that was. I was sitting there going, oh, shit, there's a ton of fun drugs I should try. <laughs> I didn't even know about Molly. Thanks, Officer John. <laughs> But the biggest failure of DEI is that the number of black people in power at big companies is basically the same as it was five years ago. In fact, maybe the only thing that DEI has accomplished is giving racist white people cover to be openly racist. So you get a little hint there at the end of where he might be going with this. But most people just saw this clip, pulled it out of context and posted it like we tried to tell y'all people are catching on. DEI is nonsense. It's not doing anything. And, and Charlemagne makes some funny points. You know, it's like it's like the D.A.R.E. program and the D.A.R.E. program. There's been like long term studies that shows that it is actually ineffective because you just sit people down and you force them to think about drugs. I used to feel this way growing up a uh, Christian kid. We would go to like true love weights conferences, you know? And so you, you take a bunch of like prepubescent and pubescent teenagers and you put them all on a bus and then you take them to a workshop and you just talk to them about sex for like six hours and all of it's really good. And it's out of the Bible and it's about purity and everything else. But then it's like, you've just been absolutely swarmed talking about sex all day. And then you just put them all back on a bus together and send them back. And yeah, bad things happen, you know, cause you're, you're getting target fixation. This happens to cyclists and motorcycle riders as well, where you can become fixated on what you don't want to hit and you end up driving right into it. You're like, I, I there's a big rock in the road. Don't hit the rock. Don't hit the rock. Don't hit the rock. You become so fixated on that target that you actually begin steering towards the thing that you want to avoid. There's all kinds of evidence that DEI has produced this as well. More fundamentally, though, what people who are against the DEI policies and practices are saying is not just that it fixates you on race and because it fixates you on race, it can produce some kind of latent racism. What we're actually saying is that DEI itself has discriminatory elements, prejudicial elements in it against people based on an immutable characteristic of their skin color or their race, which is a socially constructed concept in the first place. And so it is actually by default racist, not just that it's producing racism, but that it is, it is intended for discrimination. And, you know, all of the kind of, uh, neo-racist people who write about this, the people who are the anti-racist is what they have, have dubbed themselves. They, they write about this all the time, that the only way to deal with discrimination in the past is to discriminate actively against people today. They talk about how you can't be racist against people who hold the majority of power. They say that white people hold the majority of power, so you can't be racist against a white person, which means you can discriminate against them. If, if in a certain area, Asian Americans outpace the rest of society and they hold more of that power institutionalized, then you can discriminate against them because they have power. So you can always discriminate uh, against power, even if you're defining the power within a certain race. So you can be the classical definition of racist in order to be anti-racist. Bruh. It just doesn't make any sense. That's the point people are actually making. And because Charlemagne critiqued DEI at any level, the confirmation bias kicks in and everyone's like, he's on our side. This is the death of DEI. And I'm just not so sure because here's the rest of the clip. Blaming DEI for everything, even that bridge in Baltimore. They called Baltimore's mayor the DEI mayor, like he was given the job for being black. Then they said the shipping company was too focused on DEI instead of safety. 
but almost the entire leadership of the company is white. <laughs> no black people, right? If anything, the Baltimore mayor, he should have been the one to make it racist. Just come out like, these crackers knocked down my bridge. Wow. Okay? All right? And one of y'all crackers better pay for it. Okay? <laughs> and honestly, uh, I'm not surprised these programs didn't work. And here's why. It's just corporate PR. They want good vibes. And also, they want to cover their ass. OK, did you know that if a company gets sued for civil rights violations, just having a DEI program will be counted as evidence in their favor, even if the program doesn't do shit? OK, it's the I have a black friend of the legal system. Right? <laughs> we don't need corporate DEI. Yes, we want diversity and equity and inclusion, but we don't want it from Vaseline. <laughs> Although I'm not going to front, Vaseline has been there for the black community. Respect. OK, <laughs> right. that's right. I'm moisturized. OK. Look, man, uh, real DEI is only going to come from black leadership. I don't know how to do it because I'm not a black leader, but I do know how to tell if it's working. Just keep an eye on right wing media. The more they're freaking out, the more progress we're making. OK, so there at the end, if you just listen to the clip all the way to the end and you are on the right side politically, uh, he just tells you at the end. The way we know this is working is how much the right side of the aisle hates it. And so he, he's. He's not complaining because he disagrees with DEI as a concept or that he wants to get rid of it. He is critiquing certainly many aspects of it. He's complaining that it's ineffective and that it doesn't actually go far enough, that more has to be done, that what's called DEI is just kind of an excuse to be virtue signaling out to the communities that you know, we're really doing this and we're really working hard. But he says it's not making any substantive change. So he doesn't want DEI in theory or a department of DEI. He wants it in practice. And to his credit, at the end, he goes, I don't really know how to do this. I'm not a leader out in the world. I'm not a political leader. I'm not a business leader. I'm just saying we've got to figure this out. So what's so interesting is, number one, we know that things must be understood in their context. What happens is when you take text out of context, or in this case, when you take speech out of its context, then what you have is the complete setup for pretext. In other words, for making those words say whatever you want them to say or whatever you want them to mean. And psychologically, this is often happening at a subconscious level. Confirmation bias is such a strong psychological phenomena. If you're not on guard against it, and if you have not trained yourself to be diligent and actually listening to the full context of what people are saying, you will naturally draw out of that what you want to believe. Uh, this is how bad theological systems are allowed to exist for a very long time. It's how cults get started is they take text out of context and use it as a pretext to go ahead and push forward whatever crazy ideas they want to. And this is how people mistakenly make alliances with people who are not on the same page as them. We so desperately want people to agree with us that when they say even a part of an argument that we agree with, we jump to assuming that they have completely bought the whole of our position. In other words, confirmation bias makes everyone seem like they agree with us. We really need to slow down. James, the brother of Jesus, said that we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak, like really listen and really actually see what someone says. And we live in a sound bite society. And so everything is just kind of prepackaged and put out there to you in these little cute sound bites. And again, what, what that is, is pretext. It's removing the context around that sound bite and what someone might actually think or what they might actually believe. Proverbs 18 says to answer before listening that is folly and shame. Let's just let's just substitute to retweet before listening. That is folly and shame. Like do your work. Proverbs 18 goes on to say the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. We should really be looking into the things that we're going to promote and that we're going to co-sign just because someone agrees with a part of your argument does not mean that you are on the same page. And it's also doesn't mean that you just completely throw out the parts that they do agree with you on. He's pointing out rightfully a lot of critiques about DEI. The question is, why isn't it working at a more fundamental level? What is its purpose? And is it a societal good? Should we be discriminating against people in power? Or is the American dream um, really rooted in the Judeo-Christian idea that all people are equal before God? 
is the dream actually a meritocratic system where everyone stands on equal footing? Now, you've got to do work because everyone doesn't naturally stand on equal footing, but providing equality of opportunity without race-based discrimination is more than possible. We were attempting to do that for a very long time and racial relations improved dramatically as a result of that, all of that reversed in about 2013. At the same time, that we began to focus once again on race, not just as an immutable characteristic that none of us can control, but as the main determiner of how we were going to assess how people should be treated and at some level, people's entire worth. Former President Donald Trump put out a truth on his new social media network, Truth Social, and made a big announcement. I will be telling everyone how we're moving forward with the topic of abortion. So he put out a video. It's created an absolute firestorm within the conservative movement. The first thing he talked about was IVF and how he is just fully on board. He's going to make sure everyone has access to that. I put out an entire video on IVF, trying to look at it with a nuanced view, trying to look at it very carefully, understanding and taking into account the incredible emotional toll for people who have fertility issues and that this does offer them something, even offering at the end, maybe an ethical way forward. At minimum, what we can say about IVF is it is in a moral and ethical gray area in a, in a very large way, especially if you are pro-life. It is definitely in a gray area. And typically, when we have something in a gray area, we're wise to move slowly with anything in a gray area. But when it comes to issues of life, like whether or not if you have, you know, 10 or 20 fertilized embryos that you end up not using, are those 20 lives? And because this exists in this weird, we don't really know. And some people have very strong opinions on this. But at minimum, a gray area on life, we should just move very slowly. And what feels haphazard is just to go, we're going to do it. We're going to make sure everyone can do it. We're just going to throw caution to the wind. We're going to go for this thing as hard as we can uh, to pretend this isn't a difficult question. If you care about issues of life is silly. So that's how he starts. And then he moves on to his thoughts on abortion. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. They wanted it ended. It must be remembered that the Democrats are the radical ones on this position because they support abortion up to and even beyond the ninth month. The concept of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth and that's exactly what it is the baby is born the baby is executed after birth is unacceptable and almost everyone agrees with that my view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both and whatever they decide must be the law of the land in this case the law of the state so this is really where he's going to hone in on what his actual position is. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks or some will have more conservative than others. And that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or in many cases, your religion or your faith. Do what's right for your family and do what's right for yourself. Do what's right for your children. Do what's right for our country and vote. So important to vote. At the end of the day, it's all about will of the people. That's where we are right now. And that's what we want. The will of the people. So that's his position is abortion is going to come down to the will of the people. Now, that's packaged very well. He's going to say that line, will of the people. One million times between now and no November 20th. So get ready for that. That's his new line. Will of the people, will of the people, will of the people. What does that mean? Uh, to put it in more like colloquial language, that means, hey, you do you. And really, it's you do you on a state level, but the states are represented by the people and the people put the state representatives in office and then they pass the legislation and the people put the governor in office. And he said, you know, some people will have it very strict. There will be states who are largely conservative and they're going to go down to 15 weeks or 12 weeks or six weeks. And there will be some that, you know, nine months in the baby's almost all the way out. 
you know, and you decide you don't, then they can, they can just do that, you know, because it's really it's just the will of the people. You do you. Okay. Federalism is like the perfect system for secondary issues, tertiary issues. However, when it comes to our inherent rights, those are the very few things that must be guaranteed all the way at the, the federal level, federalism, which is allowing the states to speak and to push power down into the states. That's perfect. Secondary issues, tertiary issues. When it comes to fundamental rights, these must be federally mandated. And when it comes to inherent rights, when you read the founding documents, inherent rights must be protected even if protecting it is against the will of the people. If we have an inherent right to life, it must be protected even if a majority of the people no longer want it protected. In some crazy apocalyptic scenario where 60% of the people in America wanted for once a year us to have the purge and for 24 hours, you can just take out your anger and murder as many people as you want. Wow. If 60% of the people want for and vote for the purge, it has to be taken out. The, the, if it goes to the Supreme Court in this crazy scenario, they have to go against it because our founding documents do not leave room for you to remove inherent rights. And the first right that makes all other rights possible is the right of life. So what's Trump doing here? There is a moral uh, aspect to this, and there is a political aspect to this. And his defenders are saying, look, this is a brilliant political strategy because he needs to win, and the people he's going to lose with are, you know, suburban white women, and most of them are pro choice. And so he's just, he's got to kind of move really far to the center in this. It gives him the opportunity to kind of brag about the, the win he got on the conservative side, which is getting Roe versus Wade overturned. But at the same time, he gets to say to New York, he gets to say to Michigan, he gets to say to Massachusetts, look, you guys are going to do whatever you want. Texas and Florida get to do whatever they want. California gets to do whatever they want. And and, you know, that's fine. Secondary issues. Sure. You know, uh, smoking weed, leave it up to the states, you know, and some people are going to be an all out ban and, you know, jail time. And it's a big deal. And you go to some states right now and it is just like pot city, right? Pot city. Wow. Um, so fine. You know what the speed limit's going to be in your city, tertiary issues. Who cares, man? I mean, there's so many things. I, I, I genuinely believe the more States can own the better. That's not how we live, though. We actually live in a country that's supposed to operate that way by federalism, where the most power is at the most local level. It's not how we work. It's like the federal government takes over everything and everything is big government, except now for this one thing. And this one thing is actually a fundamental right. The government wants to decide who can and can't like rent their homes and how much you can charge for your rent and whether or not you can kick people out, all, all of these proposals for the government. But then when it comes to whether or not we're going to end a life. And so that of course is the argument. If you're pro-choice, um, you may be honest enough to acknowledge that the biological consensus for all of modern science has been that human life starts at conception. Maybe you don't acknowledge that. And so you have a logical case for why you're pro-choice. And, and I definitely disagree with that. And I'd love to have that conversation with you. How However, if you're logically consistent, like uh, a fetus in the womb is not human life and therefore we can end it. And there's my you know airtight argument or whatever. For me, I'm looking at the biological consensus that life starts at conception. We have an inherent right to life. Therefore, you cannot end that life. That's an airtight position. The position that Trump is trying to take is I do believe it's a life and I don't think you should kill it unless your state wants you to. Well, that doesn't work. That's not a logically consistent position. This is what you would call splitting the baby. And this metaphor, splitting the baby, means you are willing to create a lose-lose situation in order to get your way. And he's trying to get his way politically. Okay, I'm not sure that we can blame him. That's what politicians do. That she's trying to get his way. But he has compromised on a stand. And this metaphor comes from a story in scripture. It's the story of King Solomon. We'll read kind of the end of the story. The king replied, this woman says, this is my son who is alive and your son is dead. But that woman says, no, your son is dead and my son is alive. And the king continued, bring me a sword. And so they brought the sword to the king. And the king said, 
cut the living boy in two and give half to one and half to the other. So here's the setup. There's two women. They live in the same home. Both of them had babies like within days of each other. One night, one of the babies dies. And so there's now two women and one baby. And both of them are claiming the baby belongs to them. And so this is King Solomon, the wisest man to ever live. That This is his way of settling this. He says, just give me the baby. Give me a sword. I'll cut the baby in two. Both of you get half of a baby. Now, of course, it's understood. This would no longer be a living baby because it would be in half, right? But Solomon knows what's going to happen. The woman whose son was alive, the real mother, spoke to the king because she felt great compassion for her son. My Lord, give her the living baby, but please don't have him killed. But the other one who it was not her son, she said, he will not be mine or yours. Cut him in two. And the king responded, give the living baby to the first woman and don't kill him. She is the mother. He knew that the mother would actually have conviction and would be unwilling to compromise and would actually be willing to lose what she wanted in order to stand by her principles. She would lose what she wanted. She'd let someone else raise her baby in order for her baby to be alive. Splitting the baby means you are willing to create a lose-lose situation in order to get your way. When it comes to fundamental issues like the issue of life, how should we think about this? And I'd love for you to tell me in the comments. It's like, hey, we got to take an incremental approach. We got to get wins where we can. Trump has to change his method. He can't come in guns a blazing on the pro-life side. He can't be like talking about a federal ban and all this kind of stuff. I think politically, just statistically, you are probably right if that's your case. Now, um, I am a believer in God. I think God gets to have his way. And I think being faithful to what God has asked us to do and how he's asked us to believe and how he's instructed us to deal on issues with this – I do believe in a world where we can stand by our convictions without compromise and God will give us victory. I believe that. So maybe you don't, or or maybe you think I'm like, you know, uh, out in left field somewhere or I've lost my mind. I do believe that's possible. Do I understand the political argument? I do. And maybe you can make it even better than I can. At the same time, on the spiritual side, on the moral side, on the ethical side, um, I don't believe we should be compromising on issues that are this clear. Um, When it comes to fundamental issues like this, here's how I would say it. We should be willing to change our methods, but never willing to change our mission. And so what what would that have actually practically, tactically looked like for Trump in this situation? What I think this would have looked like is a very different rhetoric that's very clear about life, very clear about what abortion is, that the baby in the womb is a human life, that it has value, that we live in a system where what's supposed to happen is federalism as much as possible, but still holding up the hope that something can happen, that hearts and minds can be changed or that policies can be changed. But here's where we are practically. Roe v. Wade was overturned and now it's back into the states, which means if you're pro-life, you have got to be at work pounding the pavement in your states. Roe v. Wade was step one, and now we have to get more and more steps in place until possibly someday something could change at a higher level. Now, maybe you're saying, look, that would totally tank his his chances, and he would lose a lot of popular support, and maybe you're even right about that. But what does it mean to stand for our convictions? And is it ever right to metaphorically split the baby, to try to you know, have your cake and eat it too. And I do think this is what he's trying to do. He's trying to move to the middle. And I think it's just a lose-lose because on the conservative side, people feel abandoned and people who have put their their life work into trying to protect the unborn. And they thought they had the most pro-life president ever comes out and basically says, look, in New York, if they want to kill him till nine months, it's just going to be the way it is. It's the will of the people. You do you. They feel abandoned. At the same time, he is in effect the most successful pro-life president of all time because of the judges he put in place to overturn Roe v. Wade. So I don't think he's recapturing those who are super pro-choice and that's their one issue they're going to vote on. They're still not going to vote for Trump. I don't know what this really does for him except show that he is willing to compromise on some of the most essential issues possible. And when it comes to over the last 50 years, 60 something million babies who have been aborted, I think it is the most important issue in our lifetime. And I think it may be the greatest single act of evil in human history. Those are the stakes. And I don't think you're mistaken to feel viscerally about this when someone comes out and compromises on an issue of this magnitude. 
And now let's get to our last segment. Podcaster Michael Knowles recently sat down with a former OnlyFans girl who was doing very sexually explicit content. However, she has had a massive conversion to Christ. She put her faith in Jesus. She is trying now to live out her Christian life. And they sat down for a long extended interview where she talked painstakingly about what, what everyone experiences before their conversion, which is that there is this thing missing inside of you. And the more you try to fill it with things of this world, the emptier and emptier you feel and the emptier you actually become until finally you are willing to repent, to change your mind, to turn and find that God is there and he's pursuing you and he loves you and he has a life for you. And she's wanting to to redeem the pain of her past, to redeem all the bad that she has done. She's heartbroken over all of the people that she has caused to stumble through her explicit, you know, posts and videos and everything that she was doing, the conversations she had. She is weighed down by the guilt of a lot of money that she made, and she she wants to redeem her story. She's getting married to a Christian man or maybe already married to a Christian man, and she's been baptized into her church. She's really trying to do it, and she's very open and very, very raw and very heartbroken by all this. And as a result of that conversation, many people found it inspiring and many people heard the gospel in a new way that hopefully spoke to her. She talks about wanting to redeem her story by rescuing other girls who have fallen for this trap that you can make thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars by just, you know, selling your body and selling your soul. She wants to go and like rescue them and spend her time and energy on that. At the same time, there's a huge portion of Christians who responded to this with some of the most negative, vile that you can possibly imagine. And of course, social media in general, and especially Twitter is a very negative space, but you have to imagine being this young woman, God rescuing you out of this, trying to stand up and spread your faith. And these are the kind of things that you are met with. We'll look at a few of these. This is in response to Michael Knowles sitting down with her. Uh, Itchy Dan uh, sounds like uh, interesting guy. If she was actually serious about her conversion, she wouldn't be doing it publicly like this. Her only fans grift has ended and now she's moved on to milking Christians. Uh, Pearl Davis, she said, you know, what's funny. I rarely drink. I don't smoke. I don't party. And yet trad con women tell me I'm not a real Christian while simultaneously defending an ex only fans. W H O R E. Uh, someone said, what's the funny part? Christianity is about forgiveness. And she said, the funny part is she raised her OnlyFans prices, didn't delete the account, and now is hailed by Christians as saved. Let her put in a little work. A lot of people pointed out that that's not true, that she has shut down her OnlyFans account. Let her put in a little work, Pearl Davis says. Laura Loomer, who is uh, big on the political scene, she says, these OnlyFans girls can pray their slutty behavior away all they want. They will never be respectable, no matter how much they cry to God. Praying to be a respectable person doesn't work once you do sex work. It's best that we shun women like this from society forever. Um, I hope that Laura Loomer has zero sexual discre discretions in her past. I hope that she is as pure as the driven snow. And I can promise you she's not because none of us are. All of us, I mean, at minimum, here's what Jesus said while he was on earth. And Laura Loomer is, is Jewish, so she doesn't necessarily believe in, in Jesus. And, but I, I would get to Jewish examples of this as well. Here's, here's, here's what Jesus said. If you look at someone with lust, you have already committed adultery. What does she say? Uh, she, she says, once you, once you are sexually immoral, you'll never be respectable again. And there's not these distinctions. There isn't this distinctions between like you, your your sexual discretion is is worse than mine. It's like sin is sin. And on a Christian worldview, it is our sin that separates us from God. All of us in the degree of sin, it has consequence on earth. This young lady will live with the natural consequences of there being you know, awful content about her on the internet forever because the internet is forever. She'll have to live dealing with the guilt from this and hopefully getting help and going to therapy and all those things. Yes consequence like here experienced here and now it can vary dramatically but if you're not in christ it's just sin period that separates you from him you, you are positionally separated from god and that is only changed through your acceptance of christ so let's just go through some of the things that are being uh, proposed online in people's response number one can a former sex worker 
be redeemed. I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 11. This is often called the hall of faith, kind of like the hall of fame. This is like the big dogs who are representatives of us, the the patriarchs, the people who modeled this out for us. Uh, Let's go quickly through some of these names. It starts by saying faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. By this, our ancestors were approved. Hebrews is being written to a Jewish audience. By faith, we understand the universe was created by the word of God. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, Enoch was taken away. Um, By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen, built an ark. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place. By faith, even Sarah, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring. These all died in faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up his son. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob blessed each of those sons. By faith, Joseph mentioned the exodus of the Israelites. By faith, Moses was hidden by his parents and then grew up and refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Look at all these names, man. Abraham and Isaac and Moses and Enoch and I mean all the it's like the big dogs right by faith verse 30 the walls of Jericho fell down after being marched around by the Israelites for seven days verse 31 by faith Rahab the prostitute welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed can a former sex worker be redeemed yes I mean we can unequivocally say yes to this. Rahab is in the hall of faith. Rahab is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Rahab, who was a prostitute, but was converted. And now as an example, drawing millions of people and through her lineage, the savior of the world coming. Uh, What about what Pearl Davis says? It's time for her to put in some work. Uh, Do you have to work for your faith? We don't have to guess about this. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, you are saved by grace, through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. Well, let me remind you, what is Pearl Davis doing if not boasting? She she says, you know what's funny? I rarely drink. I don't smoke. I don't party. Bragging, bragging, works, right? I do all these great works, and then this OnlyFans Debbie H-O-R-E comes in and everyone's like, oh, she's such a great Christian. She's just comparing herself to her. She's she's frustrated that she's not getting the platform to express her Christianity that somebody else is. It's envy. It's not of God. Let, let's ask this question. How does God react when sinners repent? You know, is it logically possible that this former OnlyFans girl is is just grifting all of us? Is it logically possible? Yeah. It's definitely possible. People are crazy and people do crazy things. However, she at least seems sincere. She is proclaiming the gospel. She is expressing her repentance. So how does God react when people come back to him? Well, we don't have to guess about this. We see it in scripture. Jesus told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the one lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, what does he do? He joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together saying with them, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. Now, Jesus tells us what this parable means. I tell you in the same way, There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need repentance. Maybe you're right, Pearl Davis. Maybe you're right, Laura Loomer. Maybe you're right, Itchy Dan. Wow. Maybe you're righteous. Maybe you are as pure as the driven snow. Maybe it's just like, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and Itchy Dan just like right below him, okay? Maybe. Probably not. Maybe. God rejoices more over an OnlyFans girl coming home than over your supposed righteousness. That's just what Jesus said. So let's talk practically about taking someone who is very new in their faith in the platforms that we put them on. So hopefully I've made it clear, like we should rejoice over this and we should not play the comparison game. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, what you need to do is stop looking at the speck in someone else's eye and notice there might be a log in your own. Clean up your own house, take care of yourself, worry about your own personal relationship with God and rejoice over those who are doing the same, who are trying to clean up their own act, who are trying to make changes, who are trying to be a positive influence for the gospel. We see things like 
Saul, who is persecuting the Christians, who desires to stomp out this movement, who wants the Christians dead. And then he has a conversion experience and he becomes Paul and he becomes one of the preeminent church planners of all time. So we see people early. They have a zeal for the gospel and they should be sharing that. I do have a question about the platforms they shared on. I have no problem with this interview. I, my heart breaks for how many Christians are responding to it. Um, I do also think there is wisdom in allowing a season of maturity. And we must be careful not to allow our platforms to be heavier than the load that we are capable of bearing. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul is giving Timothy Timothy instructions on how to put elders in place in the church. And here's part of the instruction. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. And the devil, of course, was kicked out of heaven for growing prideful and thinking that he didn't need God anymore. And so I do think we should be careful. And look, this young woman is not trying to be the the senior elder of a church somewhere. Um, she's just trying to share the gospel. And so I know that that's not like an exact correlation, but I do think there is a principle there. And I see this principle all over scripture. You see it in Hebrews where there's constantly called to go on to maturity. Paul to the church in Ephesus says, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people and their defeat, deceitful scheming. And so there is something to having a season of maturity. Even Paul went and sat under apostles and learned to, to have some time to grow in our belief and grow in our conviction. Does that mean that we stop spreading the gospel? Absolutely not. And one of the things I think is a huge mistake inside the church and inside Christianity is people coming to the Lord and having a zeal for their salvation and just saying, you know what, once you learn the ins and outs of exegeting scripture, then you can go share your faith. I think that's a mistake because what people need is what she's sharing right now. She is not on Michael Knoll's podcast trying to exegete scripture. She's not trying to debate atheists. She is not getting into scholarly theological debate. She's sharing her story. And that's exactly, exactly what we should do when we come to Christ because we may not know the full historical cultural context of the book of Galatians, but we do know what Jesus did in our life and where he found us and how he's beginning to redeem our story. We should be sharing that and we should just be applauding people who are sharing that in their own faith. Here's what, here's what kind of the bottom line is for me. Not celebrating the redemption of others is an obvious sign you don't understand your own redemption from sin. If you think that it takes more of Jesus's death, more of Jesus's blood to redeem her than it did to redeem you, you don't understand redemption. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And listen, maybe you didn't have the outlet. Maybe your worst ways didn't expose themselves in the same way as some of these women who are turning to OnlyFans, trying desperately to fill a God-sized hole in their life. Maybe your path looked differently than you, but you need to know Jesus came and he said, look, you may not be a murderer, but anytime you've hated your brother in your heart, you are guilty of murder before God. He raised the level only to say all of us are hopeless without Jesus. And if we cannot just like almost fall on our knees overjoyed by someone coming home to the father, we don't understand our own redemption. If you think you're better than someone, you don't understand your own redemption. If you think that someone doesn't deserve the blood of Christ, you don't understand your own redemption. And I would really, really heartfeltly encourage you to spend some time understanding who God is and understanding how desperately you yourself need God. And I think that will build some grace into your experience of life to where you can celebrate like all of heaven celebrates when a lost sheep comes home. That's it for episode 57. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. We continue to grow as another great week. We put a comma in it last week. We crossed a thousand subscribers. So excited. Next stop, 1 million. Don't forget, we are the fastest growing podcast named the Clayton Tyner Podcast. <laughs> So don't forget to subscribe and check out my Patreon. The link is in the description. It's also in like a little box up here somewhere, patreon.com slash Clayton Tyner. I'd love for you to join the community. It's a lot of fun, especially the live Q&As every third Thursday. So you got time still to sign up for April's Q&A. We'll, we'll get together and have some great conversations. Um, thank you so much for everyone who's rocking with the podcast, liking, comment, share, subscribe. And I will see you next week on episode 58.